Hello, everyone. It's the 22nd of May, 2024. Welcome, welcome. Set on my porch back there. It's a little water bottle. I just noticed this thing over there. Bottom of a water bottle. Anyway, um, I wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow, Thursday at 9.30 at Forest View Cemetery, we're meeting together to um, plant American flags on the graves of um, servicemen and women uh, who were buried uh, in that cemetery and, and one other one. Uh, 9.30 forest view cemetery that's at uh it's on red dog road up in nevada city <clears throat> so um after we finish that, that cemetery we will caravan to the next one and then after that we're going to have um pizza at the uh at uh at the gallows house that's what it is so that's what's going on um tomorrow morning bring your own tools and by tools i mean um, really all you need is something to poke a hole in the ground. Um, a lot of times I'll just use a screwdriver or you can even bring a screwdriver and a hammer. Um, some guys, um, use, uh, cordless drills. Jeff has like a super long, like auger bit. So he doesn't have to bend over when he, um, drills holes and that. That's just because, um, you know, the ground's hard and they're flimsy little wooden um, flag poles that the flags are on. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it can be hard to get them driven into the dry ground. Um, if you don't have anything like that, you don't have a screwdriver in your house, uh, it's fine. Um, you'll work it out. Uh, sometimes we have, and I, this isn't really like part of our, job that we're supposed to do on uh, these Memorial Day weekends uh, when we do this in the past. But a lot of times my kids like to bring little brooms or brushes um, and other things to clean off headstones because sometimes we find headstones that are um, illegible. You know, they're just totally dirty. Um, maybe the groundskeeper weed whacked around and it just threw a bunch of grass on top of the gravestone. And so sometimes it's nice if you're into that kind of thing, to bring a little broom or brush or something to clean those off. Um, Thursday, 9.30, Forest View Cemetery. Um, we heard from Will Major over there in Ireland. Um, I got an email uh, from him um, saying that they're doing great. They're meeting some cool Christians over there from Ireland um, and other nations that are in Ireland at the time, other Christians who were from around the world. So um, that's cool. It's cool to see not only just uh, the physical labor get done, but that uh, those guys are uh, are able to connect with real human beings and, and minister to them and just have good fellowship with people that they would never meet any other way. It's pretty cool. My, my ear is going to be super bright today. Because that's where the sun is. As soon as the uh, sun begins to move a little bit, probably the whole side of my face is going to be bright. So it goes. Anyway, uh, looks like it's 5 o'clock. So let's pray and we will get started. Lord, I thank you for this time that we can get together and uh, worship you through the reading of your word. Lord, I know that you are uh, the, the one who teaches us. I know that you are the one who uh, wrote your word. So Lord, I pray that you would give us insight and understanding. I pray that you would help us to have soft hearts to hear what you have to say, Lord, that we wouldn't be stubborn, but that we would listen to you and that we would take what your word has to say and apply it to our lives. That, that this wouldn't just be knowledge, that we, we wouldn't just be gaining information tonight, but that we would hear from you, that we would see the things that we need to change in our lives, the things that we need to keep doing in our lives, and that we would apply those. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, this past Sunday, hold on, let me scroll up the top of my notes. Um, I got to teach Big Church Sunday, because Jeff's gone, obviously, right? Uh, and I just wanted to say, man, I had such a great time 
on Sunday. And that's not really unusual for me. I really love Sunday mornings. Um, it's always an extra privilege for me to teach Big Church Sunday at Simple Truth Church. Um, I, it just blows my mind that God lets me do something like that. But also, beyond all of that, um, I just love the fellowship that we have with people. And it was great to see uh, old friends who were visiting and um, just get to hug them again and talk to them and see how they're doing, all that stuff. And one of the things that uh, I like when I get to teach, when I get to cover for Jeff when he's away and I kind of have like a few Sundays in a row, I like that we kind of do like a a little miniature series. And God always lines it up some way or another. And uh, this coming Sunday, we're going to continue in our little series of the uh, the beginning of the royal dynasty in uh, is in Israel. So uh, that's actually the first dynasty failed quite quickly. Um, but then after that, we get to move into King David and all the rest. And one of the things I like about the uh, doing that also is that I get to take a bit of the Sunday morning sermon and sort of highlight a bit of it. That's why I didn't put a title, like a passage title in uh, the description today, because um, we're doing sort of a highlight out of first Samuel chapter seven. One of the things that um, I always have to work on when I'm studying, like preparing a sermon is I have to be careful not to run down every single rabbit trail. Because if you do, then you're going to just sort of leave behind the main point that you want to make in a Bible study. I, I'm hope, I hope that I'm making sense right now um, as I'm talking about main points and coherency and everything else. But if you chase down every single rabbit trail, if you elaborate on everything that catches your interest when you're studying, then you end up with sort of just a mess. And, and it's hard for people to follow, in my experience. Maybe it's just me. But you also have to not cut out every rabbit trail because then it can just be kind of dry and boring um, if you don't indulge in the things that interest you in this passage. Then maybe it feels like you don't even care about what you're learning. You know what I mean? So you have to find the right balance. And that's always difficult for me. So I really enjoy these little highlight things that we do in midweek because I get to basically pick a rabbit trail and just run all the way down it and pursue that. So um, the rabbit trail that we are going to chase down tonight is suffering and the discipline that God brings in our lives. Now, okay, to be totally honest, this isn't really directly spoken of in First Samuel, First Samuel chapter seven. Um, we talked about it in First Samuel chapter seven on Sunday morning in the context of the era of the judges of Israel, which First and Second Samuel was sort of part of the judges. Um, so the process was that when Israel walked away from God, when they walked after sin. Uh, chase other gods, God would discipline them so that they would learn not to do that. And then they would return to him. And so while this wasn't like plainly spoken out in first Samuel, that was the, the process that they were going through. Um, in fact, all of first Samuel up to chapter seven is they're in the middle of that discipline that God is bringing on their lives. Um, and then first Samuel seven is the, the moment when they decide to, um, return to the Lord after decades of being under his discipline. So this process of God disciplining Israel uh, was described a little more concisely in the book of Judges. This is book, um, the book of Judges chapter 10, starting in verse 6. And I want to remind you guys, this is a cycle that they went through all the time. Many, many times this happens throughout the book of Judges. It's just what goes on. Um, so it's described this one time here in chapter 10 <clears throat> it says the people of Israel again did what was evil on the sight of the Lord. 
and serve the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Then the Ammonites <clears throat> crossed the Jordan to fight, crossed the Jordan also to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our gods and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the Ammonites and from the Philistines, the Sid Sidonians also and the Mal Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. So Israel chased after and served other gods. And so God allowed the nations that were, you know, the main proponents of these gods to crush Israel for a time. That's the word that he used. And finally, Israel recognized that what they were doing was wrong. And so they cried out to God. God said, hey, forget it. I'm not helping you anymore. If you want to go serve the Baals and the Asherah, you call out to those people. You call out to those gods and see if they can help you. Israel didn't stop seeking the Lord. They uh, they kept calling out to him and they put away their old gods. And um, they began to seek the Lord. And they recognized that unless they did that, unless they repented of their their sin, then they would be continually cut off from the Lord. And so that's a lesson that God was teaching. He was trying to lead them through that whole process of thinking they needed to permanently give up their old gods, their sin, or they would lose the uh, protection and the attention and their position with God. And of course, the parallel that we drew on Sunday morning is that God also does that to us. God also brings discipline to us when we need it. When we hold on to sin, God will allow our enemies to crush us. And I, I mean, I don't think that that is something that necessarily happens physically all the time. But um, just like Israel, he's going to let us get to the point where we are severely distressed. And it's it's kind of the same thing. You know, you want to want... You want to live like you don't have to obey my laws. You want to live like you're not one of my people. Well, here's what it's like when you're not one of my people. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 12, the purpose behind that discipline. This is chapter 12, verse 5 through 11 of the book of Hebrews. It says, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we rejected them. Sorry, the opposite of what I just said. We did not reject our fathers. It says, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our own good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So when God disciplines us, he does it for the purpose of correction. And he does it because he loves us. He loves us as children. And um, the author of Hebrews brings out this whole 
idea that, hey, if, if God is not disciplining you, then he's not treating you like you're, like a son. If a father has a child and he loves them, then he's going to discipline them. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more later on. But when God disciplines us, um, it's for the purpose of correction. It's not pointless punishment just for the sake of punishment. It's not torture. I mean, yes, the discipline of God is painful. It hurts. It, it, he even says here, um, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But he's not punishing us. He's not disciplining us for the, to the point of pain. That's not the, the end goal, just to make us sorry for what we did um, or regret what we did. He's not disciplining us for revenge. Discipline is meant to make us better. It brings out the fruit of righteousness if we are trained by it. And so think again of that story of Israel, right? They had to get miser miserable before they would call out to God. Once God had their attention because they were miserable, he told them what the problem was. You've got all these foreign gods in your life and I'm not going to talk with you. I'm not going to deal with you when you have all of these foreign gods. And so then they corrected the problem. Now, it's obvious that it took that misery to get them ready to listen. They knew that what they were doing was wrong. They've had the law. It was no secret, right? God had it all plainly written out. They even had um, portions of the law just inscribed in a big old stone pillar to set up where anybody could go and read it. So it wasn't a secret. All the time that they were worshiping foreign gods, they knew it was wrong, but that it, they wouldn't listen to it until it became miserable for them. It's interesting, right? So then eventually they came to their senses and it yielded the fruit of righteousness in their lives. They were trained by God's discipline. That was what he was working on to do. And, you know, sometimes when we're under the wrath of God, when we're under, not the wrath of God, but the discipline of God, it feels like God is angry with us. But he's not angry. He's not wrathful towards us. Actually, his wrath against our sin was completely satisfied on the cross. There's no wrath left over for us to feel and experience when he's disciplining us. So he's not disciplining us out of anger. Um, he is disciplining us because he knows that our behavior needs to change. You know, our our sin has been paid for. Our sin is is taken care of. But our sin can still hurt us, and it can still hurt um, the people around us. And so that's what he's trying to get us to stop. This is the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 24. It says, whoever spares the, the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. And I think that most of the time, it seems to me, at least, and I'm no necessarily an expert. Hold on. As the sun turns, I'm going to turn myself a little bit more. Uh, sorry, dog. <sighs> there. That way, the side of my head was getting really hot. There's my, uh, my, hold on. Where's my finger? There it is. There's my goat pool. They drink out of that. Anyway, I think most of the time, the ways that we suffer are just the natural results of our sin. You know, for, for Israel, the example that we read, um, they wanted to go on off and worship false gods. And so God said, okay, listen, you're going to experience that. That's what you want. That's what you're going to get. It's a natural result. Um, and so, you know, life without the protection of God was miserable for Israel. They were a tiny little nation and they're surrounded by people who are their enemies. I mean, exactly the same situation they're in now, right? The false gods can't help Israel. They're, they're powerless to do anything for them. And so Israel is overrun. That's a natural result of their sin. And, you know, it's it's a little bit like disciplining and training your children. And if you think about it, I would say most of the rules, like household rules that we set up for our kids when we're training our children, um, we establish them not because of, of morality, but because of safety. You know, we, we do have things like, hey, don't be mean to your brothers and your sisters, right? That's a, a rule that everybody has in their family. Be kind, treat your brothers and sisters with kindness. 
um, share, share the things that you have. Um, think about others more than you think about. So, so we do have rules in the house. We have a law that's moral. But most of the laws that we set up in the house, especially for little kids, they're all about safety, right? Don't play with the kitchen knives. That's not because it's morally wrong, but it's dangerous. Don't play outside at dusk. That's not because it's morally wrong to be outside at dusk, but you might get eaten by a mountain lion around here. So we set up these laws, and if a kid, a kid breaks those laws, oftentimes they get hurt. And it's not because I'm actively punishing them. They're just experiencing the natural result of disobedience of those safety laws, right? They're suffering the danger that we're trying to protect them with, with those laws. You know, if you pick up and play with the kitchen knives, you might get cut. And then you're going to suffer for a little while because maybe you have to go get stitches. I did that when I was a kid. I was playing with my dad's fishing knife when uh, he wasn't around. Ended up with four stitches on my hand, like the dickens. And I'm amazed at how often kids will get hurt in the process of disobedience. And actually, it, I've had, well, I guess more than that now, but um, a couple times as a kid, I ended up with stitches. And uh, once was a kitchen knife. And the other one was when I, it was my first job. And uh, because I was 14, I would ride my bike to work at this horse ranch. And the rule at the horse ranch um, was anyone on a bike is supposed to wear a helmet. That makes sense, right? Um, so I, I rode my bike to work, and then because I was too young to drive one of their work trucks, um, I would ride my bike from different places around this big old horse ranch to get different jobs done, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I didn't even have a helmet. I mean, I didn't even bring one with me because I just didn't care about the rule. Maybe I didn't even know about the rule. I can't remember knowing about that rule before, but I, I'm sure I signed an employee handbook what was in there. And so because I ignored the rules, I didn't care about what the rules were with the bike. I inevitably crashed my bike and ended up with 12 stitches, eight stitches, 12 total in my head. Um, so we suffer when we break the rules and it teaches us, hey, the, the rules aren't there for nothing. Right? A whole lot of the Old Testament law was there to protect Israel also. And God uses the suffering that we experience in those times to bring us back. Hey, that rule's not there for nothing. That He's trying to keep you safe, and he, he makes us come back, living under the umbrella of his protection. This is the book of Job, chapter 5. We're going to talk about Job a little bit more. Um, but this is one of Job's friends speaking. I don't think that uh, the message is correct, right? But... He, Job's friends were trying to tell him that he was living under sin, so that's not necessarily an accurate application of this information, but the information is still correct. This is Job 5, 17 through 21. It says, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves, therefore despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. He will deliver you from six troubles, and seven no evil shall touch you. In famine he will redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. You should be hidden from the lash of the tongue and shall not fear destruction when it comes. So the discipline of the Lord tra trains us. It teaches us to return to him where it's safe and where he blesses us. However, I want to point out, um, and this is one of those rabbit trails that I would, I had to ignore on Sunday morning. Um, there are other reasons that we might suffer other than our own sin. Not it, it's not like every single time you stub your toe or you get a flat tire. It's because God is disciplining you and he wants you to repent of something. Um, sometimes we suffer because of the sins of others, right? Sin has consequences, and the consequences of sin aren't contained with the sinner, unfortunately, right? If I um, fall into the sin of wrath, it might pour out onto the people around me. In fact, almost definitely is going to pour out onto the people around me and it's going to affect them, right? And so I, I guess the, the most obvious example that I think of is when somebody drives drunk. Sometimes when you drive drunk, nothing happens. Sometimes when you drive drunk, you harm yourself, 
you get in an accident and it and it messes up your life. You know, maybe you get hurt, maybe you go to jail, whatever. But all too often, um, the sin of driving drunk harms people much more than the actual sinner who <laughs> commits that sin. I, I'm I'm kind of giggling at myself because um, driving drunk is not a sin that's a, that's uh, labeled in the um, <laughs> in the in the, the law of God because it wasn't invented yet. But um, anyway, sorry, I'm not going to chase down that rabbit trail. Sometimes we suffer because of the sins of others. Sometimes we suffer just because of dumb luck, right? Sometimes there, an earthquake strikes or a, a wildfire burns somebody's house down and, and it brings suffering to the people affected. Um, and those things can be a judgment of God, but they're not always. Jesus talked about um, this kind of suffering um, in the book of Luke. This is Luke chapter 13, uh, 1 through 5. It says, There were some present at that very time who told them about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So that would be somebody suffering because of the sin of others. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise punish. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Now, that would be somebody suffering because of just an accident. Jesus says they weren't suffering because of their sin. Um, verse 5, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all suffer. You will all likewise perish. So not all suffering is discipline from God because of our wrongdoing. But all suffering can be educational. Jesus told his disciples that the men who died in those tragedies weren't being judged for their sin. But death comes to all because of our original sin and that those sorts of, of terrible events can remind us, hey, we need to make sure that we are, are repenting because otherwise we're all going to suffer that death we have to repent of, of sin and cling to the one who gives us life. So the last reason that we suffer um, without, you know, it being something that we are doing wrong. Um, sometimes we suffer. Okay, so let's count, right? You, sometimes you suffer because you're screwing up and God's wants you to stop. Sometimes you suffer because somebody else harmed you. Sometimes you suffer because you were just wrong place, wrong time. Um Sometimes we suffer just because God knows that that's something that we need in order to grow. You know, I think I've told you guys about the uh, the kelp tanks down in the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is the very first aquarium on Earth that was successful in growing kelp. And the reason that they could grow kelp in Monterey and they couldn't do it anywhere else in the world is because Monterey allowed the ocean current, the waves pushing in and out to affect the um, the kelp tank. And they figured out kelp needs that back and forth tug, that constant shifting that, I mean, it looks miserable to me to be tossed around all the time, but they need that suffering in order for them to grow. And this is difficult to accept because we don't see the way God sees. We don't see life from the beginning to the end the way that God sees, but God does. And so he allows us to go through things that he knows that we need in order to get us to a place where we can grow more. Uh, the whole book of Job is about this process, right? Job is suffering because God knows that it's going to help him to grow, and Job does not get it. He does not understand. He's like, what is going on? Um, he lost everything in his life. And it was not because of his sin, and it was obvious that it wasn't just dumb luck. It, God made all of these things happen, or at least allowed all of these things to happen. And so we spent the whole rest of the book trying to figure out what happened. What, why is this happening to me? Um, he's crying out to God. He's arguing with his friends who were trying to convince him that it was his own sin that caused all of this. And finally, at the end of the book, God comes to answer Job. Um, and he just basically tells Job, I'm going to do whatever I think is best. And you can't naysay that. Um, he gave all those things to Job because 
that would be good for Job, and he can take them all away from Job if he wants to, because he knows, again, that's going to be good for Job. And we don't have the right, we don't have the authority to say, hey, that's not fair. It all comes from God in the beginning, because he can take it all away. And so, at the end, after Job went through all of this suffering, of course, um, God restored Job's rights, Job's riches, he restored Job's family, and he was richer and more blessed in the end of the book than he was at the beginning. But that wasn't actually the point of the suffering. God didn't take it all away so he could give him something better. Uh, the point was that God was teaching Job something. He was learning something that he couldn't learn anywhere else. He was growing in a way that he would not be able to grow if he was prospering. He had to suffer for that. Jesus talked about this also. This is the book of John, chapter 15, verse 1 through 2. It says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And I know that's not necessarily the most exciting thing for us to hear. You know, if you are bearing fruit for God, if you're doing the right thing, he's going to come along and prune off some of those branches. That There's no way to, to think about that except for that is painful. That's suffering. If you're a, if you're a tree... And the gardener comes along and starts cutting off your branches. That hurts, right? And sometimes God has to do that. And it's not because of, um, it's not some dumb accident. It's not some sin of somebody else, but it's God who's doing that. He's taking things away from us. Um, and that's painful. We don't understand it. And it's hard to trust that. The things that are painful for us are actually somehow good for us. But, I mean, it's it's true. And, and you can accept it in other parts of your life, right? We go through the pain of surgery when we need it because we know it's something good, right? The, the surgery isn't something that, you know, you cheated on your taxes and so now we have to operate on your arm. It's not like a, a sin that you're being punished for. But it's it's helping you to be better. It's something that's necessary and it hurts. We got to go through physical therapy and it hurts. But it's necessary for us to get to a better place, for us to to grow in a way that God knows will be good for us. So the only thing we can do is in those times, because we can't see, we have to trust in God's wisdom and in God's goodness. So again, Hebrews chapter twelve, uh, verses ten for eleven. Um, says, for they disciplined us, that's our, our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your discipline. We thank you for the ways that you Work on us when we need it. Lord, sometimes we walk away from you, and I'm glad that you love us so much that you will do whatever it takes to bring us back. And Lord, I I know that it's not fun, it's not pleasant, but I know that sometimes we have to be disciplined for us to pay attention again. Lord, it takes suffering for you to get our attention. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be those who are trained by your discipline, that we would um, regard it lightly that we wouldn't think it's because you hate us, but we would recognize your love in the ways that you discipline us because we know that, that you are doing things to work out good in our lives and you are trying to train us and bring out the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So help us to be um, obedient to the discipline. Help us to be trained by the things that, you're, that you are training us in and uh, just keep working in our lives Lord. we don't want to be ignored by you we don't want to be uh, left alone we want you to always be active in in every part of our lives in jesus name amen all right guys thank you very much for joining me once again i want to remind you tomorrow 9 30 forest view cemetery on red dog road god bless you guys see you soon